What's up, Fish Sauce family? It's Wilson. And Elton. And we're back with a fresh episode of Fish Sauce. Join us on a journey into the minds of successful founders, operators, and investors. As we learn more about their secret sauce, we hope you find yours too. In our second to the last episode for season two, we have a major operator and investor, Eric Fang. Unlike previous guests, Eric is doing both at the same time by co-founding Package, a startup improving the mobile shopping experience, and a partner at Kleiner Perkins. Fun fact, Eric was a chief of staff to Al Gore at the firm. Just to finish off his resume, he was a CTO at Flipboard, the founding CTO and head of product at Hulu, and he founded a few other startups. In this episode, you'll hear about Eric's exciting journey from startups to investing. But it's not as easy as people think, because Eric until this day still prides himself in someone who aims to work harder than everyone else in the room. No wonder he's been able to do so much in such short order. And the hookup for this episode came from my good friend Andy Chen, who was also at Kleiner. And Annie was also helpful in introing Phil Wang, which if you haven't heard that episode yet, definitely rewind it back. What's Eric's secret sauce? Stay tuned to find out. I am an engineer by trade. I, to this day, still consider myself engineer first. And at Hulu, was very happy just building product and banging out code. And it was a really exciting experience there. But what brought me to Kleiner and got me into the world of investing was really one thing. And that was a person by the name of Al Gore. So uh, I had the fortune to get to know Al and get to uh, spend time with him. And it was his idea to, uh, to actually go join Kleiner. And that way I could spend even more time working with Al because uh, Al is a strategic advisor and partner at Kleiner. And he was very involved uh, when I first joined in 2010. Uh, and it was just uh, such a unique opportunity to go and, and, and you know, make it your day job to hang out and, and try to help and support uh, Vice President Al Gore. So that's really what brought me to Kleiner more than anything else. First of all, how did you meet Al Gore? You know, that's the magic of, uh, of Kleiner Perkins. We, we sometimes play this funny internal game where, you know, you could randomly pick any name, any name in the world. And uh, probably somewhere through the Kleiner network, you could get a meeting in you know, some finite amount of time, which is pretty amazing. It's just the, the Kleiner network is so powerful, so magical. I was uh, good friends with uh, a partner there called, uh, his name is Chihua, who's now gone off to start an amazing fund called Goodwater. But when he was a partner at Kleiner, uh, we got to connect and know each other. And I would occasionally help him out with diligence or providing feedback on companies. And he once said, hey, you know, is there anything I could be helpful with you at. And I just mentioned in passing that I was very passionate about clean tech, just as a personal mission, as a topic area that I was just I thought was so important to the world. And I, I just happened to mention that to Chihuahua one day, and he said, hey, would you like to meet Al Gore? And I was That's like, awesome. uh, of course I would like to meet Al Gore. He's like a hero of mine, literally, like a <laughs> hero. And uh, he introduced me to Al in 2008, and we spent the next two years just getting to know each other. His son, Al Jr., and his daughter, um, Sarah, were in LA at the time, and I was in Hulu uh, down in LA as well. So he would actually come through uh, LA quite a bit. And when he was in town, he might just text me or call me and be like, hey, Eric, I'm in town. You want to go grab coffee? And I'm like, of course I want to grab coffee with you. <laughs> you guys are and text buddies. That's I know. Awesome. It's amazing. When I was at Kleiner, I spent about half my time working with Al Gore on the clean tech practice and the other half working with Chi Wan and other partners on our digital practice. And the number one thing that, that I got out of that was how different building a company in San Francisco and the Bay Area is versus building a company outside and in, in different parts of the world. So I had done startups before. First company I'd started was started in Austin, Texas. I'd started a company in Beijing, China. I'd worked in Seattle. I'd worked in LA. I'd worked in a lot of different places, but never in the Bay Area. And Getting to see entrepreneurship and company building the barrier through the lens of Kleiner really informed me that I was just missing out. I, I wasn't a true technologist. I wasn't a true entrepreneur until I had experienced that in the Bay. It's just, it's so different. I really wanted to experience that. So I then left Kleiner in 2012 and I did a tour of duty through the Kleiner portfolio. I incubated a company at Kleiner, which we then ended up selling, uh, ended up running engineering at one of our portfolio companies, Flipboard. So still involved all in the Kleiner family, but not investing, just sort of working at the various portfolio companies that we had just to, to get that first hand, hands-on experience about company building in the Bay. And it was uh, a really fun, exciting time. So, so thankful that I had the opportunity to go do that. Now I focus on early stage investing specifically with consumer companies. You mentioned that you're an engineer first. Being a VC is very different from being an engineer. What was going through your mind in terms of kind of transitioning into that role? The closest thing that I've ever experienced that's a little bit like investing was I did research work at 
Microsoft for a couple of years, primarily out of the Beijing Research Lab. That had actually a lot of similarities to investing in that research and investing, what you have is ultimate intellectual freedom. The reality is that I am here to learn full time. That's really what, what venture investing is about. It's about learning full time. And through that process of learning, investment opportunities emerge. The idea is not to invest full time, it's really to learn. Because you have to be thinking about derivative effects. You have to be thinking about the next, not the current, but what's coming next. And that just takes a level of intellectual curiosity and learning. And a lot of that is what we did at research. When we were researching products and coming up with new research technology, it wasn't trying to solve something that a customer was facing right now today. It was trying to anticipate problems they would run into 10 years down the line. That was the closest experience I'd had previously to what venture investing is. It's, it's a full-time learning job. And that's just very different than product engineering at Hulu or at Flipboard at some of these companies. So at Kleiner seems like such a playground of ideas and labs, all these different things you can pursue. And you were interested in clean tech before and you worked on some consumer products. How did you finally decide, hey, all these different opportunities out there in the market, I want to decide on pursuing packaged as the new startup that we're going to work on and build a team around it. I'm always inspired when when facing challenging problems by um, Jeff Bezos's regret minimization framework. You know, if you forecast out 50 years when you're, you know, sort of in the twilight of your life, what were the decisions that will cause you to have regret at that moment? And try not to make that decision. So I've always thought that that's such a wonderful framework. So looking back now at why we decided to do package, it was through the lens of that regret minimization framework. And we just felt like there was such this interesting moment and inflection around video content that somebody's going to go off and take this opportunity. Somebody's going to go off and, and I think build a really interesting company here. And we'll have really regretted if we didn't try to do that ourselves. So the idea really came from uh, a couple of different trends that, that we saw happening in, in, in the digital space. The first is that uh, YouTube, we felt, was becoming such this broad platform of every content type possible, and it was good at everything, but did that maybe mean that it was no longer great at certain things? And could you start to take vertical pieces of YouTube that you, if you just became really focused on that, you can actually create a better experience for that content type than YouTube could? And Twitch was the perfect example of that, where it was a vertical video service around game streaming, and they did such a great job on, on developing that platform that they created a better video experience from game streaming than what existed on YouTube. And we just felt like this verticalization of YouTube is a real trend that could really happen. And a category that was very popular, but potentially under leverage on YouTube is product content. The second was this idea that e-commerce is so much these days about the efficiency of shopping. And what's lost around that process is the discover journey. It's the serendipity of shopping, the entertainment of shopping. It's all about yell something at Alexa speaker, it shows up at your door two days later. That, that's wonderful. But what's lost is this idea of like, you know, I, I just, I think that camera lenses are cool. I just kind of want to like browse and read and watch and kind of play with camera lenses and kind of geek out. And I might not be in the mood for shopping now, but it just, it's entertaining for me because I'm such a passionate fan about that product category. That experience is just hard to get online. It's hard to get digitally. E-commerce isn't been focused on that. So we felt like that was a huge opportunity that was, that was unmet as well. And then the last thing is that Often when you think about entrepreneurship, what you're looking for is giant business opportunities that have not been solved yet in a digital world. There's an analog equivalent of that, but there's not yet a really successful digital equivalent. That speaks to a, a really large opportunity. You know, that, that was Hulu. Television is this huge multi-billion dollar industry in an analog world, but there wasn't a digital equivalent of that yet. In many ways, that was Flipboard. You know, magazines are this huge analog business, but there wasn't a digital equivalent of that. Video-based shopping, home shopping, QVC, HSN, is a huge multi-billion dollar, they did 12 billion revenue last year alone, huge market opportunity, but there's not a obvious digital dominant player in that yet. So very rare now to find those opportunities. I think it was more widespread, more common a decade ago when the internet was, or two decades ago when, when internet and businesses and mobile businesses were just starting. But now the landscape is, is starting to get pretty crowded. A lot of these opportunities have been solved really well and they're just few and far between. So when you see one, that seems like such a great opportunity. And, and I just felt like we would have regretted had we not gone off and done this given these 
really interesting trends that we got excited by. We yeah. were so interested in, in just when we did a lot of customer research around this category and, and talking to a lot of folks in different demographics and a lot of millennial shoppers. And what was so surprising is that they didn't even go to Amazon anymore to kick off that search. They would go to YouTube. You know, I'm interested in buying a drone. I would say like DJI Mavic unboxing. And I would just watch a video on YouTube and consume content that way as opposed to going off and reading a bunch of reviews, looking at a bunch of like blog posts or uh, expert write-ups on the product. I would just go watch a video. And there was something about the authenticity of the video that made that that medium really compelling for products. So can you describe a little bit more about the product itself? I know that we talked about it's a video. It, does it link to YouTube? What is it? Is it an app where I go on an app where yep. I see videos of people being pulled from YouTube? Or where is it? How does it actually That's work? a great question. Uh, our company is called Package. Our first app is called Unbox. So if you go to the app store and search for Unbox, you can find the app today. At Unbox, you can watch the best YouTube unboxing videos curated every day and chat with experts about those products in real time in the app, and any product that you see, you can buy with one click. In many ways, we wanted to be inspired by what QVC and HSN have done and create a mobile modern version of that promise, that product promise, that product value proposition, but for a different demographic. And it all starts with unboxing content. That, that is really the key insight in that we think of unboxing as the UGC evolution of the QVC video format. Users creating what in a previous generation, you had to have created in a studio with trained actors and professionals making this content. But users are creating a version of that, and in many ways are creating an even better version of that. It's more entertaining, it's more authentic, it's short form, short clips about products, it's wider range and selection of products than you get in a QVC or HSN world. And it's super entertaining. When you think about a video service, there's like all these different questions that you have to solve in terms of, is the experience good? Is there a business model here? Is there a way to connect with other passionate people so to build you know, maybe a, a social graph that has a, a viral coefficient so you can grow virally? All of these questions that you have to answer, but the, the thing that we don't have to answer is, is this content any good? Because we know it's good. It's been battle tested on YouTube. It is proven to be very popular. These content creators are so talented and it's really, refreshing actually to have to uh, to be able to build a, a video service and not have to answer that question of is your content any good you have so many roles from cto roles ceo roles product roles are those different skill sets sort of inherent in your nature where you just kind of just kind of know all these different roles naturally you can kind of pick it up or if you have to learn them systematically how were you able to do that i am a huge believer in learning by doing there's no substitute for that and i'm also a really big believer of running like headfirst directly into a weakness. Don't avoid it, just like run headfirst into it. But do you ask questions around, do you have mentors, friends, and these roles that you didn't experience yet and get advice from them, or you just kind of head on and learn by yourself? Engineering training, I think, is always about breaking big tasks into really small tasks that you can actually accomplish in, in a very short time frame. So that's always been the, the way that I've tried to, to problem solve things, and, and especially new areas that that I may not have a lot of experience in. Don't be intimidated by something that looks like it's gonna take a year to go do and a team of 50 to go off and try to execute. Like, try to figure out if there's something you can accomplish today, this afternoon, before lunch, that's actually meaningful and tangible and, and just go off and slowly execute on that and absolutely average people around you. I've always assumed that walking into the room that I was the dumbest person in the room. I, just a safer assumption to make. And you have something to learn from everyone in that room around you and try to get that. Try to learn, try to, try to ask the questions, try to get that knowledge. And that is also circling back to why entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley is so important. This is the best place in the world to ask questions because everyone here is more helpful, I think, than anywhere else in the world. The secret of, I think, what's made Silicon Valley successful is this common realization that life and entrepreneurship and company building, it's not a zero-sum game. Most people here collaborate more than they compete. Building a company in, say, Seattle, when I was at Microsoft, it would have been uh, unheard of to go grab lunch with somebody at Amazon. Like, what, what, you, what, what are you doing? Are you, are you serious? That's, <laughs> you're gonna, you, you, you actually, I mean, you better go put on like glasses and a hat and you know, like a fake mustache and to hide it from everyone. Like, it's crazy, you can't go talk to them. 
But here, collaboration is, is the norm. It's, it's not the exception. And I think it's this universal understanding that there are actually bigger challenges that every company faces than competition with each other. It's really about market forces. It's really about customer behavior. It's really about, you know, what, what are you know, just actually dis- disruptive trends that are happening. And we're all together fighting that common enemy as opposed to spending time on like the little tiny skirmishes that happen between competitors. And, and that's, I think, very unique to, to Silicon Valley. That's what makes it really special here. You mentioned a lot diving straight into your weaknesses. More specifically, can you describe to some of our listeners what is one weakness that you dive straight into? Can you share with us whether it worked? And can you also name one situation where you dived into a weakness and it didn't actually result in positive change? On the purely technical side, I've always prided myself on just just tackle problems, take them on head on and, and execute and you know, just assume that you're gonna get it done. My nickname back in the day was, uh, they called me the 10 minute guy for a while because every time there'd be a problem, I'd be like, yeah, just give it to me, I haven't done it in 10 minutes. And it would never take 10 minutes, never. <laughs> but I just assumed, I was like, ah, it'll take 10 minutes. Just like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bang that out and it would take like, you know, four days. But <laughs> that was just my, my me- mentality going into it. When we launched the first version of Hulu, I ended up writing a lot of the front end. We built it on Rails, which was a, a framework that I didn't have a lot of experience with. A lot of the programming tasks that came up, I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bang it out. Like, just give it to me, and I'll have it done in 10 minutes. And it would, of course, take far longer than that. But that, that was an example of just like, instead of trying to get bogged down with, can you do it? So I'm just trying to get bogged down about all the reasons why you shouldn't be working on it. Just start like picking stuff off and doing it and launching features and checking in code, learning on the fly and just getting stuff done. And, you know, over time, just developed a familiarity with the framework, got a lot of confidence around it. And I, I think that was a, a great example of just, you know, if you dove head first, good things can come out at the other side of it. Actually, funny enough, an area that, that I'm struggling with right now, in all, in all honesty, is what we're going through with packaged. Because... Again, irrational confidence and belief that, you know, just let's just execute and get stuff done. I thought that, you know what? Investing, that's a lot of work and this really great opportunity at Kleiner. I love company building. Let's just do them both at the same time. Just figure it out. You know, like do Monday partner meetings and then in the afternoon go off and work with the team and, you know, then come back and meet with some entrepreneurs in the evening and bang out an investment memo. And, you know, you can do it all. And I realized that that's just, that's not possible. I now recognize that it's just not scalable and, you know, need to figure out a a better long-term solution. And I think just the, the learning just about how, how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. It's, it's so humbling in terms of the challenge and the difficulty and the amount of work and the focus it takes to be an entrepreneur. Doing it firsthand is a constant reminder of that, but in every way, shape or form, it is a complete full-time 100% 100% commitment. That's the only way it works. And that's something that, that you know, I'm struggling with now because I thought that there are different models and maybe you could kind of do it part-time. And, and thankfully, I have a great team around me that can help short, short of the burden. But again, I'm, I'm very much walking a room, just assume I'm the, the dumbest person in the room. Clearly at the company right now, I am the least productive person at the company. So that's just <laughs> something that we're going to have to figure out long-term. But one of those times where maybe had I thought about it a little bit better going into it, I, I, I could have planned for it better. But my, my kind of gut instinct was just, hey, just assume that we can do all these things and just try them all. The learning has been, well, also be honest about the feedback that you're getting from the market and course correct and adjust. And the feedback that I'm getting from my time in, in, in the market trying to be both an investor and, and a CEO is that, you know what, this is not scalable. It's not going to work. You're going to under deliver to commitments to everybody that you're, that you're trying to uh, work with. And let's take that feedback. Let's not ignore it. And let's figure out a solution that, that is actually scalable. So switching gears a little bit, I want to dive deep into your upbringing. What is your upbringing like? What community were you grown in? How have those values and upbringings instilled in your company right now? I think I had a very more generic, so immigrant upbringing in terms of like just amazing immigrant parents that really put my future and my success above theirs. I owe so much to my parents. The most important thing that I've ever learned from them is just the value of hard work, which I think is a pretty common lesson amongst immigrants in, in this country. And, and because of that, like, hard work has never intimidated me. In fact, if it's not hard, something's wrong. Like, why is this not hard? Like, there's some, I must not be doing it right if it's not hard. Like, I just, like, hard work is just the way of life. So. Because of that, I've never shied away from hard work. I've never been intimidated by that. There's never a question that I will work harder than or as hard as anyone else in the room is a given. But one thing that my dad really instilled in me too was do it 
really smartly too. That's when you get, I think, an amplification effect, right? If you take hard work, but you do it in a really smart way, I think really amazing things happen. I remember he told me this story that, you know, hopefully I can tell my kids one day and sort of pass on. It's a very generic story, but it stuck with me. And he told me that uh, there was once this, this logger that was out in the tree, uh, sorry, out in the forest, and he was cutting down trees. First day, he cut down 12 trees. And he was like, yeah, it's going great. And then the second day, only cut down 10 trees. He was like, huh. Man, that, that's, that's, that something's wrong there. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna work twice as hard the next day. And came in, worked twice as hard, worked even longer hours, didn't take a lunch break, was just like killing himself, only cut down eight trees. It's like, holy crap, like what's going on? So he went back in the next day and he's like, I'm gonna work as hard as I've ever worked before. I'm just gonna like work 24 straight hours. I'm never gonna stop. I'm gonna put everything I have into it and I'm gonna get back to 12 trees. And he cut, 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 cut. And he was only at six trees. So ashamed, he went to his boss and he said, look, I'm, I'm so sorry, I started at 12. and you know, now I'm only doing six and I, I can't work any harder. And his boss said, well, did you sharpen your ax? And he's like, oh. So that to me is why you constantly have to go and run after your weakness. Why you constantly have to go and, and do things that you've never done before. That's sharpening your ax. Investment is a way to sharpen my ax. Like I've built products, I've built code, I've built teams. I haven't fundraised as that often. And that's a great skill to add to your tool belt. And I want to sharpen my ax there. Commerce, for example, I think that I've spent the last decade in advertising-based business models, whether it's with Hulu or Flipboard, and there was a period of time where it looked like everything was gonna be ad-supported because of Google and Facebook, and now I believe markets are shifting and there's gonna be so much more around transactions and around commerce-based business models, so that's something I don't have a lot of experience in, so I've been jumping like headfirst into commerce, I've been investing in e-commerce companies because I think that it's going to be such an important part of all startups going forward. So these are how I run headfirst into things that I'm not good at, but it always stems back from this idea that you gotta be constantly sharpening your ax. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and it's a dot of blue and a sea of red, but it was still very much a more conservative outlook and also not a diverse outlook. Like I was the only Chinese kid in my school, sort of just not, didn't grow up in a um, very diverse, multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan, very forward-thinking community. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, because I think I learned a lot of really important values there. So I pride myself on, on being very respectful, being patient, being hopefully a Southern gentleman. Those are just things that learned from my time in, uh, in Austin. Certainly didn't get a chance to understand how big the world was. And what opened that up for me was getting to live in China. So I lived in China from 04 to 07. I was doing research out there for Microsoft. I was also teaching at Tsinghua University and I started a company when I was in China. So those are some of the just experiences that I got that showed me a lot about the rest of the world and, and, and how big it was. So it was a really formative part of my time there. And, and really my interest in, in China was from my, my parents. Just growing up in, in, in Texas, it would have been easy to lose any connections with my heritage, with the language, but my parents were very good about, you know, Sunday Chinese school and, and making sure that I still had ties in with the culture and with the language. And then when the opportunity came up to go to China, they were incredibly supportive and encouraged, encouraging about doing that. So I think that was just such a good anchor to have and a reminder that the world, not, not even just through the lens of being of Chinese descent, how important it is to recognize your heritage, but having that, that tie to another world just shows you how big the world is and how important it is to understand the scale of the world. Because it is easy to kind of fall in the trap and think about how just what you can see and that's all that, that you need to pay attention to. And it was great not to lose sight that there is so much that you can't see and you have to really pay attention to that too if you want to make an impact in this world. My parents were just so good about exposing me to a lot of different things. I grew up playing the piano and the violin and now actually I, I, like, I love to sing. I started singing in college. A lot of different sports growing up. Having a well-rounded opportunities and I, I think that maybe has gotten me comfortable with just doing things that, that I don't do well because a lot of what I did growing up was just try things that I didn't do well and things I didn't even like but my parents were just like you don't know you don't like it unless you try it and you try it and if, if you don't like it then don't do it but don't tell me you're not going to do it until you at least tried it so I think that idea of experimentation was really ingrained early on a lot to, to my parents. I just want to say that resonates with me a lot because when I think about my career I've started in consulting did a little bit of each project or industry because I was just so curious and then I would try out you know, a uh, startup and tech and Square, and then, then I started thinking about, oh, I want to try VC, because I think that's very interesting. And there's very different industries. And, and at some point, I wonder if I, you know, or the team that we want to build here, we literally say the next five to 10 years, we're just going to do only this, yeah. and we do it the best we can. 
And sometimes I think there's a trade-off between being very open-minded and being interested in very different things and just, you know, losing a little bit of line of sight for just being super disruptive and 100% focused on one thing in the long term. That's right. When you get focused, truly to not hedge and to say, like, we're, gonna, we're really going to go for it all. We're going to try to do the absolute best we can here without any, like, look at assuming that this thing doesn't work. Because I think when you start to pre-assume some of those things, it just maybe biases you to actually not achieve the biggest possible goal, the biggest possible outcome you could. So we're, we're about to run out of time. And in typical fish sauce fashion, we wanted to ask, what is your secret sauce? Both figuratively as well as literally. On the figurative side, I think that what, what I really pride myself on in terms of trying to differentiate, trying to you know, make it my superpower is that I am super responsive. You send me an email, you're gonna get one back. You send me a text, you're gonna get one back. That is true, you did respond very quickly to there all you our go. emails, so. And if you're not getting something back, it's probably intentional. I didn't, I'm not missing it. It's hard for me to go to bed at night if there is a single unread or unanswered email or unread or unanswered text or message. I just, I, I can't. How do, you, how do you balance quick response versus a thoughtful response? Yeah, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't necessarily have to be quick. It just has to be done before I can put it out of my head. Again, if I'm not responding quickly, it's intentional. Maybe it's because it's better that I don't, or maybe it's because I need more time to think about something very thoughtful, but I, I try not to miss anything. I'm just uncomfortable missing things that are sent my way. So, inbox zero. Inbox zero, Twitter notification zero, text message zero. Slack zero. Slack zero, everything zero. It's one of those like, hopefully it's a strength, it's probably a weakness too, because just definitely drives me and the family a little crazy, but that's just how I roll. Literal sauce, it's all about the vinegar, baby. Oh, gotta oh. have vinegar everywhere with everything. It's all about the vinegar. What's your favorite food with vinegar? What food isn't good with vinegar? Come on, <laughs> <laughs> everything. I love vinegar. Vinegar, it's all about the vinegar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the soup dumplings and vinegar. Soup dumplings, vinegar, ketchup with vinegar, uh, <laughs> with fries. Yeah, vinegar everywhere, man. Fish and chips with vinegar. Oh. Fish and chips with vinegar. Everything is better with vinegar. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Fish Sauce. If you like what you heard, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and sign up for our newsletter for the latest updates and special surprises. Also, treat yourself and a friend to a Fish Sauce t-shirt from our swag store, fishsaucepodcast.com. We can't wait to see you rocking on the streets. If our mission resonates with you, please leave a review on iTunes. And don't forget to share with your friends so we can welcome them into our Fish Sauce family. And lastly, big shout out to our awesome editor, Christian Edwards, for making us sound better than we actually are in each episode of Fish Sauce. What's, What's your secret, secret sauce? sauce?